here. This is a very honest reaction. He just did the, uh, <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? It's literally what he did, right? He just threw his hands up in the air, what can I do? And then called. And that is usually not what you want to do when you have a hand that really does not want to face a river bat. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I'm here today with episode 330 of Weekly Poker Hand. I want to thank you for being here with me today. We're playing 2-2, no limit, Texas variety at Best Bet Jacksonville. And Steve, under the gun, picks up Ace-10 offsuit, which, you know, is normally a pretty good hand, except for he has one big problem. It is that he is under the gun at what I think is an eight-handed table. From under the gun at an eight-handed table, you really just should not play the big offsuit cards, mainly Ace-10 offsuit, King-Jack offsuit, and Queen-Jack offsuit and queen 10 and jack 10 offsuit and 10 9 offsuit and ace 9 offsuit right all of these junky offsuit big cards should just be folded and the reason is because you're in terrible position and when you raise you have to ask what is going to call me and it's going to be primarily better big cards suited connected type hands suited aces and pairs and all of those hands are going to do fantastically well against you in position so even though ace 10 offsuit may normally be pretty good it should just be folded under the gun plus one or under the gun, from the earlier positions, right? I actually have Game Theory Optimal charts in the Poker Coaching app. If you have not already downloaded the app, check it out. We have over a 1,000 quizzes there, a bunch of classes. We have um, downloadable static charts, like what you're probably used to seeing. And then we also have Game Theory Optimal charts, where you can set your stack size, set your position, set the action your opponents made, and it will tell you the perfect Game Theory Optimal strategy, assuming your opponents play well. Now, if your opponents play poorly, you can adjust your strategy accordingly. And that is part of the skills we teach you at pokercoaching.com. So anyway, go get the app, check it out, leave a review, I would appreciate it. All right, so here, ace 10 offsuit does elect to raise, it's a little bit too loose. Kristen under the gun plus one with eight, six of clubs, pretty quickly calls. Kristen's made it clear she likes to play hands. Eight, six suited is definitely too loose. Around to Amber in the small blind, she's playing $267 deep. She has jack nine of spades, and this is a situation where if the blinds were, let's say, two five, and Steve made a three big blind raise under the gun, I think calling with jack nine of spades would be perfectly fine and viable. But when Steve raises huge to seven and a half big blinds, you just have to fold out the vast majority of your drawing type hands from the small blind and the big blind, and that's because you're gonna have a difficult time realizing your equity from out of position. This is a play that almost everyone makes in the small stakes games, but it ends up costing them all a lot of money in the long run. And it turns out if everybody makes the same mistake, nobody wins, nobody loses, it's all okay. But as you move up in stakes, your opponents are not going to be making this error. They're just going to be folding the jack nine of spades. And that's going to result in you losing a little bit of money every time you make these calls. People defend their blinds way too wide. And this results in them just losing small chunks of their stack every time they see the flop. All right, so jack nine suited should probably be folded. It's close. And then Ron in the big blind with pocket sixes has a pretty easy call. So pocket sixes is going to be a way easier hand to play than jack nine suited because jack nine suited is often going to make something like middle pair. Middle pair out of position is not where you want to be. And, you know, sixes is usually not going to make a good hand either. But when it does, sixes already pretty much knows it has the nuts. Whereas when jack nine makes a pretty good hand, it's going to be... Um, top pair. And top pair out of position, again, is not a great hand. I understand you can make straights and flushes and all that, but the problem is, even when you do, you're going to have a difficult time getting paid. So, we see the flop four ways. Flop comes. 10, 8, 8. Two diamonds and a heart. So this gives Kristen, Trips, and Ron, I'm sorry, and Steve, top pair. So uh, Steve ran into it last week. He's running into it this week again. Let's take a look at what happens. This is a scenario where I think the right play for um, the blinds and Steve with ace-10 is to actually check. And the reason I think Steve needs to check with his ace-10 in this scenario is because if you bet, you always want to ask, what is going to give me action on 10-8-8? Well, a 10 is going to call you, but you, know, you have a 10 in your hand. Also, the players in the blinds could very easily have an eight. And I mean, if we see Kristen playing four, three offsuit last week and eight, six suited this week, clearly she has all the reasonable eights as well. So even though ace 10 is almost certainly the best hand, I think you need to check. And you may say, but don't, I don't want to get out drawn. There are lots of draws available. And it's true, there are a lot of draws available. But what's the alternative, right? Well, if you bet and someone calls and or someone raises, your hand just went from being a pretty strong made hand to essentially a bluff catcher. 
And you don't really want to be bluff catching in these scenarios whenever your opponents have also announced they have a good hand. You'd much rather check. And then if uh, Kristen bets the flop, she could very easily have a draw or nothing, right? And, and that would be fantastic because then you're against substantially wider ranges. You're going to find that hands like top pair on a coordinated board or you know middle pair good kicker or top pair bad kicker, these hands are usually good if a little bit of money goes in the pot, but they're usually not good if a lot of money goes in the pot. And this is where a lot of players make mistakes. They take these hands that they think are pretty good, and to be fair, they are pretty good, but then they end up putting in a whole load of money. So anyway, I think Steve probably wants to check, and if he gets a bad turn card, he can just check it down. Maybe call a bet, right? I think a lot of people think that top pair has to be played for lots of money. Let's just blast the chips in. But it's okay to just take it slow. Sometimes you get outdrawn. It's okay. It is okay to get outdrawn and lose little pots. Like, for example, let's say the turn is a king of diamonds. So 10, 8, 8, 3 diamonds. Let's say small blind bets and big blind calls. Or small blind bets and big blind folds. Just fold. Just fold your ace 10. You got a terrible turn. It's not your board anymore. You lose. If the turn's like a two of spades, though, and someone bets, obviously you don't fold your ace 10. Anyway, he does go for a bet. He bets $35. Kristen likes to just call. She slow plays it. All right. So typically the time you want to slow play is when you have a hand that is almost certainly best, as her 8-6 is, so it satisfies that condition, but also it's very unlikely to get outdrawn. And when Steve is betting this 10-8-8 board, you have to think that Steve is going to have some 10s, which have a little bit of equity, over pairs, which have some equity, and also draws, which have a ton of equity. Also, Steve is probably going to be somewhat unlikely to fold hands like pocket jacks, or even ace-10, or jack-9, or queen-jack of diamonds, right? He's just not going to fold these hands if he does get raised. So this is a situation where on the flop, I think Kristen has a pretty easy raise, and she can be happy playing for all the money in this scenario because there are so many draws available. She does call, though, and she gets a pretty awful card, the Ace of Diamonds. So Steve checks pretty quickly, and then Kristen just snap pulls out a pile of chips and starts lining them up. She's ready. Pot's 130. She bets $60. So uh, interesting spot, right? So the turn's the Ace of Diamonds giving Steve the top two pair. Ask yourself, what would you do in this scenario with the Ace-10 of Diamonds? Pause, I'm sorry, with the Ace-10 when the Ace of Diamonds comes. Pause the video, type it in the comments below, let us know, commit to it. This is the type of thing we do at PokerCoaching.com in the quizzes. You have to commit to your answer and you get graded on it there. And uh, maybe you'll like your grade, maybe you won't. I think when the Ace of Diamonds comes, Steve does, again, like on the flop, have still just a bluff catcher. So with this bluff catcher, I think the only play that makes any sense right now is to check and probably check call because there actually are still some hands that you beat, like Jack-9, nine, 9-7, nine, Queen-Jack, maybe even like 7-6 if Kristen's range contains those hands, which it probably does because she plays lots of hands, it seems. So... This is a situation where I definitely like the check from Steve and I like a check call. Do not make the mistake of check raising. Don't check raise all in or anything like that because then you're going to get called by flushes and eights and that's going to be terrible. So just check and check call. So take a look at Steve's mannerisms. I actually saw this whenever I reviewed this hand a little bit earlier. He sits back, he hems and haws. He's like, oh man, what am I going to do? It looks like he might even be saying something or breathing heavy or something's going on underneath the mask. This is a spot where when you are check calling with a bluff catcher, you do not want to do this sort of uh, like hand wringing like he's doing here. This is a very honest reaction. He just did the, uh, <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? It's literally what he did, right? He just threw his hands up in the air. What can I do? And then called. And that is usually not what you want to do when you have a hand that really does not want to face a river bet. And right here, Steve does not want to face a river bet. Even if he knows Kristen's somewhat aggressive, you'd much rather this hand just get checked down. Like I said on the flop, right? If this ace-10 gets to play a small or medium pot, it's pretty happy and it probably wins. But if a lot of money goes into this pot, it's going to be pretty unhappy. So in this scenario, when you are check calling the turn, you want to check and then, you know, reasonably confidently call the turn. You don't want to hem and haw and make it look like, oh, maybe I should fold. Because if you actually are thinking about folding two river bets, 
Understand, you just induced a river bet by that action. So if you just induced your opponent to bluff you on the river, and you know you're probably going to fold whoever bet, as you realistically should on this three diamond board with two eights, even with a hand as good as ace 10, that's going to result in you essentially forcing your opponent to play well. And you do not want to force your opponent to play well. So if the river is a blank, I would still reluctantly check call if I was Steve. Um, this time, though, the river is a diamond and it goes check, check pretty quickly, which I think is fine for Kristen. I would tell Kristen to slow down a little bit. She, she plays very, very quickly. I don't think there's any merit in value betting in these snuff bots, but you certainly could consider it, especially if you did have any random diamond here. Like if you had jack of diamonds or nine of diamonds, I think it's viable, especially given um, Steve may think that Kristen is overly aggressive. I'm Again, I'm not sure of their particular image, but you always want to make sure you are taking a little bit of time because you always want to put a little bit of doubt in your opponent's mind and you want to be able to look at them and make reads based on how they look in various scenarios. Like for example, let's say in the spot, Steve was like, pretty confident. Like you made a read and you thought Steve had, Steve had a really good hand. He's going to call a bet for any amount with, and then you check back your hand. But then you see him turn up this bad bluff catcher and you're like, oh, that read was wrong. Now I'm not going to say you should be taking this to the extreme and taking forever and slowing down the game or anything like that. But you're going to find that generally you don't want to play too especially quickly. You want to play fast. You want to keep the game moving. You definitely don't want to be the slowest person at the table or anything like that. But you very often do want to do your best to try to develop reads on your opponent. So anyway, check, check on this hand. I do want to go back to the flop, though. If, if um, Kristen just raises the flop here, she would raise the flop, she would get called, she would bet again on the turn, she would get called, and she probably would have ended up getting to play a lot bigger hand with her trips. And instead, she got a bad river and could not get paid. Someone just started banging over my head. Can you all hear that? The real world. We're still stuck at home. Coronavirus is still happening, as you see everyone's mask. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. What a world we live in, huh? All right, that's going to be it for today. Good luck in your games. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. If you did, click like, leave me a comment. Let me know that you liked this and you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you next time.